Γεια χαρά και πάλι. Ε, πάμε στον επόμενο, στον επόμενο καλεσμένο μας. Καταρχήν να σας πω πριν πάμε στον Μαρκ Ράιλι ότι βλέπω πάρα πολύ συμμετοχή και αυτό με χαροποιεί πάρα, πάρα πολύ γιατί είναι πολύ σημαντικό το, το event. Έχουμε πάρα πολύ καλούς καλεσμένους και, και γενικά τώρα το ξαναλέω, συγχωρέστε με ότι είμαι και λίγο φλακαρισμένος. Ε, όσο πιο πολύ μπορούμε να συμμετέχουμε γιατί οι άνθρωποι αυτοί μπαίνουν live, συμμετέχουν live οπότε θα ήταν πολύ ωραίο και από την πλευρά μας τα... Να, και να ρωτούμε και να του ρωτάμε πράγματα και να λεπιδρούμε με αυτού. Γι' αυτό είναι και το όλο νόημα του να γίνεται live το, το event. Οπότε εδώ θα καλωσορίσω τον Μαρκ Ράιλι. Δώστε μου ένα δευτερόλεπτο. Hello, Mark. Can you hear me? Hello, Mark. How are you? I can't hear you. Hey, yep. how's it going? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. How are you? I am well. How's it going so far? Yes, it's been great. We have a lot of people joining in. Excellent. And uh, give me a second to address the Greek audience in uh, Greek. Okay. Λοιπόν, παιδιά, αυτό είναι ο Μάρκ Ράιλι. Καταρχήν, είναι ένα από τα πιο σημαντικά ονόματα τη ξένη multimental σκηνή. Είναι ένας άνθρωπος ο οποίος έχει αφαιρωθεί σε αυτό το κομμάτι, έχει κλασική παιδεία καταρχήν, είναι μέλος του, του, της All Guard, είναι ένας άνθρωπος ο οποίος έχει δώσει πάρα πολλά και στο εκπαιδευτικό κομμάτι, έχει, εμπλε, έχει εμπλακεί πάρα πολύ και με τον οργανισμό στον οποίο ανήκω και εγώ το Society of International Ultimental Drummers και είναι ένας από τους οδηγούς αυτού του πράγματος και επίσης είναι πολύ μεγάλη μου χαρά που, το, που πλέον είναι και, και τον αποκαλώ και, και δάσκαλό μου. So, Mark, I was telling about you in Greek. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining, in, uh, for joining in. It's really an honor having you in our first uh, rudimental uh, festival. It's very important for, uh, for uh, people uh, uh, like you to, to, have, uh, to have you guide us in our first steps. So I want to thank you very much sure, for, sure. Uh, for being here. Well, honestly, it's a huge, it's an honor to be here. Um, so to speak to all the people who are listening and watching, I think you're a part of history right now. This is honestly a really exciting time. Uh, COVID has been terrible and has made us uh, learn to be more creative and more innovative with our projects. So I think everyone who survives through the COVID physically, mentally, and professionally, if you're able to get through this right now, you're going to be one step higher than everyone else because you have learned so many new things on how to adapt and also how to pivot. So I think we'll have some fun today. We'll talk about a lot of different concepts, some history, some technique, things like that. So yes. Alexander, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor and a pleasure. Honor too. So you can go ahead and if you want, and then share your screen. All right, so there we go. All right, this is the bearing of the torch and I am going to be going in and out of screen sharing. So as long as I have the host permissions, I think we'll be good to go. But this is the story or a story of rudimental drumming. Uh, my story, a little bit of the New York story, which is where I'm from, originally from about an hour north of New York City. My parents are from the Bronx, so we're a big Yankees fan. And we are going to play some music real quick. So let me stop sharing this and... All right.
Wow, that was absolutely amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so that is a piece by Trombone Shorty called Neff. Uh, Trombone Shorty, if you're interested, please look him up. He's a trombone player, trumpet player, a little bit of a percussionist, uh, but he's from New Orleans. And so hopefully, a little bit about hope, me. Yep. Hopefully Facebook won't uh, cut this off due to copyright claims. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. All right. It's Sorry. education, though. It's education. So, no. So <clears throat> the idea behind uh, Trombone Shorty from New Orleans is that New Orleans is also part of my story as well. I went to undergraduate school in a little tiny town in the middle of nowhere, which was very healthy for me as a human being because I was from New York and I was not the best student and I needed to focus on my percussion studies. So I uh, went to Northwestern State University in Louisiana and was able to go to New Orleans and Dallas several times. So I'm going to back to some screen sharing at the moment and we will go through some New York style American fife and drum as well as some other styles as well. Okay, so here is a picture of a bunch of really famous groups uh, if we start from the left-hand side, we have some gentlemen that are in blue, blue polo shirts. Those are alumni from the Air Force Drum and Bugle Corps, um, 1950s, 1960s. This is now also during the time of President Kennedy. And a lot of those drummers were also in the Air Force Pipe Band, as well as the Drum and Bugle Corps. So uh, a lot of famous, famous drummers there, John Bosworth, John, uh, John uh, Bob Zarfoss. Uh, if you look them up, they're a big part of the American story. The next group over, if you look, is the same drums. If you look closely, there are eagles on those big rope drums. Those are members of the US Army Old Guard Fife and Drum Corps, my home unit, without the hats and wigs and colonial uniforms. That is our Class B uniform. Uh, if we look in the center, we have uh, drummers with tan. That is the Commandant's own Marine Drum and Bugle Corps. Uh, they are stationed at 8th and I, uh, which is the, the Marine Barracks in Washington, D.C. Next to them, you'll see one solo drummer wearing, he's a really tall guy with a, with a eagle drum and a blue polo shirt. That is Dave Loyal of Loyal Drums. Next to him is drummers from Pershing Zone, the U.S. Army Band. They are in the white. And then if you look at the whole big row of green drums or green drummers, that is uh, His Majesty, the Kingsguard of Norway's drummers. Uh, so this picture was taken at 8th and I in Washington. So we would have this night each year after the Virginia International Tattoo, uh, where the percussion sections would all get together and they would come up to Washington. And we would have basically a big giant drum off, not, not in a comp competitive way, but an exhibition way. So this was in 2018. This was a lot of fun with having all these drummers out there playing. And so I have two invitations to all of your listeners today. Alexander, anyone listening from Greece, I have two invitations to you. I'll start with the first one. The first one is if you are ever in Washington, D.C. or would like to come to Washington, D.C. once travel restrictions are, are released, um, you are more than welcome to ever visit the, the old guard drummers and watch rehearsals, come check things out, maybe take yeah, a lesson. This is great. I'm planning, uh, I'm planning to do so. Excellent. And of course, I applaud Mark. He said that we are all the best to go to the Washington to see the old guard in the old guard on YouTube, you will find a Sorry, Mark. Nope. It's all good. All good. So uh, that is invitation number one. Uh, I'll get to invitation number two a little later in the presentation. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, this is just my explanation of drumming. I will tell you, I try to say that I am not an expert at anything. Um, a lot of people just like to say that I am, but if I could be an expert at one thing, I'd like to be an expert student. I think research always creates more research. So most of the time when people say, well, I'm the expert at something. Okay. Well, you probably are to a degree. But I know when the people who really know their craft, they're not going to be telling everyone how great they are at things. So I would love to be a good student and continue the learning process. So the way I kind of approach this uh, are two main categories, a traditional set and a modern set of rudimental drumming. So if you look at a lot of these uh, pieces up here, or these, these little bullet points, the American colonial period, you have a lot of French, you have a lot of British, you have a lot of German, and a lot of Spanish kind of 
influence happening on the American East Coast from Florida all the way up through uh, New York and New Jersey into Massachusetts and to even Canada. Uh, and in those times, rudimental drumming was very basic. And so I'll play one piece here. Uh, this is called the Turkish March. And we have this very basic marching type of approach here. So the Turkish March is going to be really open drumming, very kind of basic rudiments, and it has a very open sound. So here it would be a basic march during this time period. So the Turkish march has a lot of quarter note and downbeat ideas. Jum, da dum, dum, jum, da dum, jum, jum. Always meant to have a heavy left foot to march the soldiers or march the troops from one point to another. And that was the idea of this military drum that had started so far back into the ancient Greeks, into the Egyptians, into the Chinese. There were always these drums of battle, these drums of war. But the idea of rudiments really start to get organized around 1300, thir late 1200s, early 1300s with the Swiss mercenaries. And there's this battle between even the current Swiss and the current French of who actually started rudiments. And this is a funny discussion because the Swiss really did start it, but the French paid for it. So that's one of the big discussions is that all the kings would hire the, the Swiss mercenaries to come into their army King Louis XIV, all of these French kings gave lots of money to these Swiss mil uh, mercenaries to come fight for the French. But the Swiss also fought, fought for the Spanish, the Italians, the Germans, and also the English. So if we fast forward, King Henry V of England, on his tax records, you can actually see that he purchased six large Swiss drums, as well as six large Swiss drummers to come play for the English army as well as teach other English drummers how to play these rudiments. So and a rudiment at this day was just really a pattern. OK, so flam, flam, very easy open one, para diddle, para diddle. And there's an argument of if para diddle is actually the right beginning. Is it right, right, left, right, left, left, right, left, or single, single, double? And there are arguments of which one was it a diddle para or a para diddle that shows up first inside of these original documents and if you really want to know a lot more about that you need to speak with a man named marcus esterman he knows all of these crazy things he has 500 700 documents that go into the 1500s really really good guy so as we go further into these traditional styles and modern styles Sorry, Mark, we lost uh, your sound. Can you hear us? Mark? The Flamicube. Okay. okay. Yeah. Sorry, we lost you for a, for a minute, but okay. now it's okay. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, so at the Flamicube is the first American rudiment, which now if you think about the rudiments that we played in the Turkish march, very downbeat oriented. The flamicue is the, flam the, the first rudiment with a inverted or a uh, syncopated arm stroke. So the idea of the flamicue starts to come into the American rudimental scene in 1862. So there's a piece called The Girl I Left Behind Me. And if you look, we will add a stick click, which is now our first kind of visual, and this American flamicue.
that was great. <clears throat> so if you hear that idea back and forth, that was this idea of playing a seven stroke roll <clears throat> into a flamicue. And if we think about the spacing and the time, this is something very big in rudimental, traditional American rudimental drumming is that every rudiment was not meant to play exactly with a quarter note or exactly with an eighth note or exactly with a 16th note because metronomes were not around on the battlefield or in these camps when they were teaching these rudiments. So a phrase of a radimacue being this. Sorry, Mike, can, can you please switch back to your camera? Yep, and absolutely. Thank you. So the idea of a radimacue, that idea is to scoop up to the quarter note. Okay, so many people will think that you play two sixteenth notes into three sixteenth note triplets, and you put a diddle on the first, sorry, the second sixteenth note. Da, diga, da, 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 diga, da, 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 da. Back then, there were different teachers who would interpret this differently. So inside of New York, Connecticut, and Massachusetts, you have three different styles of how this could be played. New York was considered to be zippy drumming, and we're talking kind of Gus Moeller, we're talking about Les Parks, Bobby Thompson, that go into these generations now of DCI or, D or WGI, indoor marching percussion drummers. This is kind of a more modern approach, which would be the two sixteenths and then three sixteenth note triplets approach. And then they would take the space of the triplet or the sixteenths and they would scoop it. So it would be. So, and they would put the space kind of there and make it very tight. Massachusetts was kind of the older style. And even if you think about it in geography, older style, newer style, Connecticut is going to be kind of in the middle. The older style is very open sounding. So instead of this, or, or this, it was almost a pure six tuplet. So the grace notes are completely open to this triplet feel the entire way through the rudiment. So if we look at it, Massachusetts, very open, six tuplet, all the way through the Rademacue. New York, very tight and zippy, very true uh, triplet, but the 16th notes kind of have this kind of style to them. Connecticut is very much in the middle. Two straight 16ths, two thir uh, and then three 16th note triplets. So there are three different ways that would have been played even during the early days of rudimental drumming in the states with those three different states, which would have had three different teachers in each of those states, probably way more than three, but there was usually a general style per each state, and they would wear that kind of as a badge of honor because later on they would have state competitions, which one could play that style the best. And when we get to NARD in the 1930s, and we talk about this, the 26 American rudiments, all of these competitions start to kind of really focus on really one style of playing. All right, so we'll go back to some screen sharing, and go to the next slide. <clears throat> so World War II, World War I, we start to see all of these styles start to come together with all of these drummers from around the world because of, because of the military. And so when we get back from World War I, we have New York City as this big melting pot of cultures, which it already started as, but now you have these Americans that are going off to these other places and coming back. So this is a, a photograph of my grandfather uh, from 1933. I had no idea that uh, my grandfather was a musician. It was very strange. Uh, really? My, yeah, my... Uh, <laughs> This grandfather, I knew he was an army ranger uh, during World War II, and I knew he was in the Pacific, and I knew that he also had seen some very crazy things, and I knew that he had passed away when I was very young. So he taught me how to throw a baseball, he taught me how to go fishing, he was my favorite grandfather, and I knew he died when I was very young. Fast forward, I start taking drumming lessons from a man named Nick Antanasio, about 70 years old, and Nick 
became kind of my grandfather figure right around the time where my grandfather had passed away. So Nick taught me about drumming. Nick taught me about life. Nick taught me about a lot of things. When I graduate high school, my mother hands me a pair of drumsticks and says, here, I need you to have these. And I said, this is from Nick, right? Obviously, these must be from Nick. She goes, no, these are drumsticks from my father. I said, you have to be kidding me. No way. So it turns out that she hands me these drumsticks and this picture of my grandfather. And this is a drum corps competition, rudimental competition. If you look in the back behind him, you see a second man wearing a black uniform and he has a briefcase. That was a judge's briefcase at a drum corps competition in the middle of the Bronx in the 1930s. Very so this is, yeah, very, New very York's, yeah, so this is a New York drumming competition in the 1930s after World War I, and I have family legacy that goes back to that, which is very interesting. The sad part about my grandfather, which is also a part of my history as well, is that he was in the military. He saw a lot of really terrible things. When he came back and he turned 65, he had post-traumatic stress syndrome, and or post-traumatic stress, and he ended up stepping in front of a truck and he killed himself by committing suicide. So, from my point of view, I start to look at my job in the military as a blessing that I get to help as many people as I possibly can. And if somebody had been able to help him, maybe through drumming, giving him a stronger outlet, giving him this connection of music to try to put those demons aside, he may still have lived a lot longer of a life. So for me, this idea of drumming is a very personal, professional and spiritual journey for me. Uh, and that's why I am so passionate about it. All right, so these are some, some, some drum corps from New York that are very famous. The Charles T. Kirk Fife Drum and Bugle Corps. They had fifes and drums and bugles all together. They were the beginning of this kind of new modern era of a little bit faster, sorry, faster tempos and also faster learning how to teach. Like how do we teach this in an educated way that's not so military but civilian style? Uh, 1950s, the Sons of Liberty are the first drum corps to start incorporating classical structure, meaning classical music structure to its music. So coming up with medleys and movements and organizing the rudiments so that they flow from one piece to the next piece so that it feels like it's seamless and not just one piece, then the next piece, then the next piece. And the big guy behind that is Les Parks, and we'll talk about him in a little bit as well. The New York Regimentals, 1960s are really accredited for being the first group to put together the fully chromatic fife. So the fife before this was only six fingers or six holes and only could play really sort of more basic melodies. The, the chromatic fife comes into the picture. Now you can play anything that any flute or piccolo could play. So they, they explore that repertoire. The last one to me is one of the most absolute interesting groups, Charles W. Dickerson Fife and Drum Corps is a controversial and also very exciting group. It was a Boy Scout group, meaning young boys that were only African-American. So it was a fully black fife and drum corps that was actually taught by Mr. Gus Moeller himself. So Gus Moeller would make drums in New York and Gus Moeller was kind of a hard man. He would not make you a drum unless he knew you could play it. So the story is there's this challenge between Gus Muller and one of his friends saying, I dare you to teach this fife and drum corps, this all black corps. And at that time in the 1940s and 50s, it was very controversial because the United States still had segregation between blacks and whites. So Gus Muller takes this challenge. He teaches this corps and it becomes today still the only true fully molar style drum line that actually stays in existence. And everyone in that drum line is now a fourth, fifth, a third, fourth, and fifth generation Gus Moeller student, which is all really, really incredible. So again, also, if you're interested in any of these topics, I will share uh, this document easy, easily. I can give uh, Alexander my contact and people want to ask more questions, they can do so. Uh, but Sorry, just a quick yeah. uh, comment. Ε, for, for, for the Greek audience. Ε, εδώ να, να τονίσω πως ε, ένα από τα, πέρα από τις εκπαιδικές γνώσεις που έχει ο Μάρκ και όλο αυτό το απίστημο, απίστευτο παίξιμο είναι πραγματικά ένας άνθρωπος ο οποίος δίνει πάρα, πάρα πολλά. Το ανέφερα και στην αρχή και τώρα ανέφερε στην παρουσίασή του πως ε, 
εάν κάποιο θέλει να επικοινωνήσει μαζί του προκειμένου να του δώσει, το, να του δώσει υλικό, παιδιά πραγματικά το εννοεί. Δηλαδή είναι ένα άνθρωπο ο οποίο όσο προλαβαίνει, δίνει και είναι πολύ πολύ χαρακτηριστικό και πολύ πολύ σημαντικό για έναν άνθρωπο με αυτή, με αυτή τη τερατώδη γνώση να μπορεί να βοηθάει ε, και προπαιδικά τον κόσμο να ασχοληθεί περισσότερο με αυτό το πράγμα. Οπότε σα παροτρύνω, επικοινωνήστε με το Μάρκ, είναι πολύ πολύ σημαντικό και πιστεύετε με αργά ή γρήγορα θα επικοινωνήσει μαζί σα πίσω κι αυτό. Sorry for that, Mark. No problem at all. Uh, so this group here is the group that has the biggest connection to me. So this is the Sons of Liberty from Brooklyn, New York. If you look, you can see all of their competition trophies at the bottom of the picture. They were one of the premier fife and drum corps. And you see all the medals on the members there. And if you look in this front group of, of players, the man who is sitting to, if you're looking at the screen, you're right. He has all of those medals and does not have the snare drum sticks. He's got bass drum mallets next to the drum major. That was my teacher, Nick Antanasio. And his bass drum actually is in this photo. Let me pull this real quick here. If we look here today, this is that bass drum that actually is in this photograph here. So I become a collector of drums as well. Um, and I love the story of these, these guys. And I love the story of the drums on how they became kind of iconic, uh, iconic stories inside of the drum core world. So we'll go back to here real quick. And I've got a recording of the Sons of Liberty actually playing in 1955 in Brooklyn. So here are the Sons of Liberty. So if you hear the, the, the group playing, it's very much paradiddles, less than 25, seven stroke rolls, nothing very, very complicated. But this was the first time of really thinking about these rudiments, specifically how they fit a melody line. And the next slide here is this man, Les Parks. So Les Parks uh, went to the Juilliard School of Music in New York in 1950 and study with Saul Goodman and Morris Goldenberg. If you're interested, you know those kind of two famous names when it comes to mallet playing and timpani playing. So Les starts to study uh, classical music. He also was a backup drummer for Gene Krupa, as well as when Buddy Rich would come into town. If, but I didn't know this until recently actually, but these big name drummers that would play in New York City, they'd play at Smalls, they would play at these other jazz clubs. They would book three, two to three sets, and the big name would usually play the first set and then go to another club. And he'd play one set there, go to another club, go to one set there and play to another club and make all of this money. And the backup drummers would play the second and third set. So Les was the, a backup drummer for many, many of the big names in, in New York City and New Jersey in the 19, uh, basically late 1950s all throughout the 60s and into the 1970s. So this gets into the honor of me, of why I choose to play. Uh, and I also talk about this with a lot of my students. I ask them when they're trying to play and they're trying to practice anything of quality, why are you trying to play? Are you playing for yourself? Are you playing for others because you know you'll play for a concert? Are you playing for something else? And this question for me is always very powerful because if I think about who I'm trying to honor when I'm playing, it gives me more power and more focus in my practice time as well as also my performing. So if I'm playing for me, it only goes so far. If I'm playing for a crowd reaction, that only goes, only goes so far. If I'm playing for the idea of honoring people who have given me what I have today, they've given me this great story of drumming. They've given me this great idea of playing rudiments. They've given me this, these ears and the mind of quality control. That to me is a very powerful, sustainable fuel for the fire of why I want to be such a high quality player. And I like to talk with, with groups about that. A lot of kids 
high school through college will start to say, well, I like to play because it's fun. I like to play because I enjoy the experience of playing with others. Also, these are great things. How sustainable is it? And also how during COVID, it's a very ch a challenging question. So in my, in my viewpoint, when I think about trying to honor my drum instructor every practice session, or I'm honoring my grandfather, or I'm honoring some mentor that was in my life, that gives me a lot stronger of a passion to practice better. So this is a photograph from about 19, sorry, 2012, 2013. Um, this is Nick Antanasio and that drum. And so that drum head right now is sitting at a museum in Ivoryton, Connecticut, the Company of Fifers and Drummers Museum. And now we get to invitation number two. Invitation number two is, if you are ever interested in coming to the premier fife and drum event in the United States, you are more than welcome to come as my guest, and I will help organize it for you. I will help try to find ways that we can get you a drum and get you some music and come play. It's at Deep River, Connecticut is the name of the place. So Deep River, Connecticut is what they call a muster. It's a fife and drum festival from anywhere from about 60 to 100 fife and drum corps that come for an entire weekend. There's camping, there's drinking of anything from milk to lemonade to beer to maybe some whiskey, not sure. <laughs> um, may, may or may not happen there. But uh, this fife and drum muster is a giant festival. And this festival is for me, honestly, very interesting because you start to see a lot of people that are playing at these musters in these different generations. So you'll see a man like Nick Antanasio, who is 70 years old, 80 years old, 90 years old. Now, God bless his soul, he, he's passed away. But then you would see a drummer that was his early student that may be 65 years old, 70 years old. Then an earlier student or a younger student that's 40 or 50 in his 30s, in his 20s. And as you're looking through this festival, you're going to see kids who are seven years old with drumsticks trying just to figure out how to play double strokes next to a 70 year old man which is incredible to see this and the festival is set up in three days friday you come in you set up a camper or you set up your tent if you want to do that a lot of people stay in a hotel and just come and drive Sorry, which part of the year this is this uh event? this is in july okay it's always in july yep the third weekend in july great great question um so what happens is you come in friday friday evening is what they call the opening tattoo and they pick maybe five or six groups to come and perform at the tattoo. After the tattoo is over, they have what's called the circle of friendship. So the last group is in formation, rank, 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 rank. The drummers are always in the back. And what happens is they play the last piece and they play a, what they call a stock tune or a, or a stock beat. So if it's Yankee Doodle or if it's Battle Hymn of the Republic, Johnny Comes Marching Home, one of these classic tunes, everyone knows this basic stock drumming part. So if it's they'll play this basic stock drumming part and everyone that's there joins in the friendship circle and they march around into a circle, they stop and they have a giant jam session, sometimes with close to a thousand people playing fifes and drums. A thousand people? Having lemonade. A thousand? So. <laughs> <laughs> this must be a wonderful experience. It is. And I, that's, that's how I grew up as a kid, as playing this style. And I would come and I would spend four or five hours straight just playing these beats. It was just, it was fun. And I would watch these other drummers play and my teacher would take me and he would put me next to these other drummers and he'd say, copy them, copy them, copy them. And so as it came, it turned out his friends were these legendary American drummers. And I just got to study each of these hours by watching them, copying their hands, looking at how they stood, how they would wear the drum, all these details. And I would just try to be a chameleon and pass around with all of them. Yes, so, I, I think it's uh, very important for someone to watch and observe how things are played. And this is a big problem we have. Problem, let's say, not exactly a problem. This is something we're having here in Greece because a uh, part of uh, learning the rudimental style is watching others, other people to play and not only just uh, reading it in a, in a book. Well, and that's a great conversation. I think also when you speak with John Wooten or you talk with Brett Kuhn or Scott Johnson, any of the marching guys from the States, 
they always have this conversation of when do you start to teach students to read in combination of teaching them how to listen? Because this is a very delicate balance of, no, I'm playing it perfectly because I'm reading the dots on the page. And if we think about music, the dots on the page are only the best representation that we can come up with for the sound that we're hearing or the sound that's created. So it always starts with sound. And then we try to capture the mathematics on how to best articulate and analyze the sound. And I think we've done a very good job over the last 500 years of capturing what it should look like. But so but the problem is if we look at things only from a mathematical point of view, you're not getting as much of the art side. So I look at music as this balance between science and art and you have to find some balance point in yourself as a player, but then you also have to find some balance as a teacher. Where do you begin to teach these students and how do you communicate the ideas? And I think that's a very important balance. So as a kid growing up in these musters, Friday night was this big jam session. Saturday was all performances and a parade. So you actually start the day with a parade. Everyone marches down the street whole town of Deep River comes out, everyone's cheering, they're grilling, making hot dogs and hamburgers, people are waving flags, it's a great, great parade. At the end of the parade starts official performances. So every group will have between five and 10 minutes to perform. And of course, if you have a hundred drum corps, it's a very, very long day, but everyone has their tents, they're socializing, they're you know, eating with each other, their, their kids are playing together. It's a very big family affair. And again, at the last core that plays at the end of the night, they do the same thing and they start this circle of friendship at the end. Then everyone joins in and we play till sometimes two or three in the morning, depends on when the police all show up. <laughs> but <laughs> it's usually the town has it be allowed until midnight is when the, the, the sound ordinance is okay. Um, but then there's sometimes a nice police officer who lets you keep going later, so. That's the Deep River Muster, and you're more than welcome to come, and I will supply the lemonade for you. Okay, that's a deal. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so moving on, we're going to kind of speed up through a few of these photos. All right, here, so friendships. Um, lots of friendships in the rudimental drumming community. Uh, and my friend John Wooten got to experience some of the Swiss hospitality, which I think is very interesting, because sometimes people say that, the Swiss are kind of very cold. They're very calculated. They're very, if you play a rudimental drum, you are going to be welcomed so quickly. It's not funny. So the thing with the Swiss is they have, I think what's considered to be the largest fife and drum festival in the entire world. It's the Basel Fasnacht. And they, for three days, we'll talk about that a little bit later for three days, they have this giant carnival in masks and costumes and fifes and drums. And there are close to 10,000 fifers and drummers that march through this. It is, if you like rudimental drumming a little bit, you owe it to yourself to go there at least once in your lifetime. So this group here is a group out, out of Basel that actually plays American style fifing and drumming. And that's also something that's very cool. When a lot of these, these older communities want to expand, they create a different style group. So there's an American style kind of scene in Basel, Switzerland. There's probably about five or six Swiss cores that all play American style. So some more friendships here. Uh, these are some of my American and Swiss friends all coming together. Uh, 15 years later, this was the power of music. This guy that's in this photograph here off to our, our left is a man named Massimo, champion drummer, got in a horrific skiing accident when he was younger. And we thought he was dead, he had a coma. This is Massimo 15 years later. The power of music is really what kept him alive is what he said. He can speak, he doesn't have use of his right hand, but he can still drum all of the beats. If someone plays the right hand and he can play the left hand, he can actually play along with you. It's amazing. Uh, international language, you talked a little bit about this with that first picture with the Norwegian Kingsguard. Um, I was very lucky early on in my career to play with the top secret drum corps um, out of Switzerland. So 2005, I was a, a playing member, went to Australia, went to Switzerland. We tra traveled through Singapore. Um, but after I performed with them in 2005, 
I was asked to come on board to be the arranger for the Top Secret Drum Corps. So if you watch Top Secret on YouTube or anything like that, and you look at the videos between 2005 and 2010, a lot of that music they're playing is stuff that I wrote while I was also writing for the old guard. So there's a few funny videos uh, in 2005 and six where people are on YouTube arguing with each other that the old guard stole the top secret music. No, nope, top secret stole the old guard music. And then somebody writes down there about four or five lines. And they said, actually, Mark wrote both pieces of music. <laughs> so <laughs> what I would do is if I wanted something to be more traditional, I would write it for the old guard. If I wanted something to be more contemporary, I write it for top secret. And I would see which one worked for it, each one. And I would try and do both. Okay. Basel Fosnock, we talked a little bit about it. Uh, this is every year, usually between February and March. It's attached to the Lenten Carnival Festival. So if you're talking about Ash Wednesday, you're talking about um, Good Friday and Easter, it's all based on that same exact calendar. So strangely enough, it's attached, but it's one week later. So if you think of traditional um, Ash Wednesday and you think about everything where it's getting into Lent, the Basel Fasnacht is one week after Lent begins. So if you do your timing correctly, you can do uh, the Venetian Carnival in Venice, and then you can just pop up to Basel and you have two weeks straight of, of great parties. But that's up to you. Yeah, two, two weeks of rudiments, yeah. Two weeks of rudiments, <laughs> right. So this next uh, recording you're going to hear is a very old traditional Basel march uh, played on old Basel drums you can hear that there's no muffling in the drum. It's gonna have a very ringy sound. They were made of brass um, and calfskin heads. So this is an old, old Basel march. All right, so what I'm gonna do next, I'm gonna play a Basel march. The beginning of it is called, this is called Celanese, and I'm gonna play it on a typical Basler drum. This is gonna be chrome, uh, sorry, aluminum around the outside, but also chrome plate around the aluminum. So very tinny sound, but it's also very light. Um, the colors, if you look on here, this black and white, these are symbolic for the city of Basel. If you look at a lot of old traditional military drums, you're going to have two different colors here. And I'm not sure. I think we have uh, David on here from Sweden maybe listening as well. Uh, but if you look at the Swedish drums, they're going to have blue and yellow as the, sig the signifier of the drum from Sweden. So there's different colors that would usually match these. If you look at the Swiss Army drummers, they're going to have white and then they're going to have red to signify the Swiss Army for Switzerland. So this is a beginning of a piece called Celanese. Yeah, that was, that was great. <laughs> I you. love those inverted flam taps. So first thing, if we look at this very interesting stick here. So the Swiss stick has this very long taper kind of all the way from the butt. That is very symbolic of a Swiss drumstick and not an American drumstick. The American drumstick is going to have really the taper start maybe about right here. And the shoulder is only from here to here when it gets to the neck. So most of the weight for an American stick is going to be in the front. So you get a lot of the rebound coming off the head, especially if you're in the DCI world. The Swiss stick 
is really meant that you can control the stick down and it's lighter weight in the front so that you can keep the stick down and the rebound is not shooting the stick back up. And if you look at the grip, the grip in the Basel style is to put the thumb underneath. So it's almost like a baseball bat or a hammer. And I'm really trying to hammer down the stroke. So this is really a power grip. And when you're talking about the details of fulcrum and everything like that, you're still working these fingers, but it's really, it's a grip where you're having to kind of manipulate the hand in a very different way other than this front fulcrum kind of idea. So, um, Interestingly enough, the other part that's great about the Basel drum, if we look at the bottom of it, we have different types of snares. So we have gut snares, traditional kind of a gut, cat gut snare. We also have cable that's in here, like uncoated cable, like we would for a concert drum, as well as drum set wire. So wire snares, cable snares, and gut snares, so that you can have all the dynamic range happening from piano, and you can hear those really light strokes to mezzo forte. And you can hear the character of the sound changing as well. Very psh, 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 metallic. And then you get a little, right there, it's a little bit more throatier because that's now engaging the gut snares and the cable. And here, and you're really hearing that cable and those gut snares really kind of come back onto the drum head. So, it's designed to be able to be played in all the dynamic ranges for the Basel drum. All right, uh, let's keep going forward here. Sorry, Mark, before you go on, just to yeah. remind you, we have five more minutes or so. Perfect. Uh, we are gonna go to this last bit here. Um, Fusion. So right here, this is an interesting, I've been very involved with Percussive Arts Society for the last eight to 12 years uh, in different capacities. I've been on the marching committee from 2006 or so, so I guess 14 years, uh, but I was the chairman for the marching committee for PASIC for the last five years. So I just stepped down this past year. Uh, a great guy named Sean Womack took over for me. Uh, but this was a clinic that I was really lucky to be a part of in, in 2012. Um, this was a drummer's heritage project talking about how rudiments can bridge all of the percussion fields. So I was there as kind of the traditional uh, U.S. traditional fife and drum guy that also knew Swiss drumming. So that's me on the end. Next to me is a guy named Jeff Prospery. Jeff Prospery is a judge for DCI and WGI. He taught Phantom Regiment for many, many years and now is the drum leader at the U.S. Army Hellcats at West Point. Uh, next to him, if you know your percussion folks, is Michael Burrett. Uh, he's the professor of percussion at the Eastman School of Music. Mike is honestly one of the best marimba players you will ever find in the world. Wrote tons and tons of music, uh, but Mike... Mike fancies himself, by his own words, he fancies himself a drummer. He gets paid to play marimba and loves playing marimba, but he just really loves playing rudimental drumming, which I think is really cool because he doesn't really think it. Most people don't think of Mike as a rudimental guy. He is, they think of him as a marimba player, but he loves rudimental drumming. Uh, and behind the drum set is Pat Petrillo. Uh, Pat Petrillo is out of New Jersey. He grew up playing in DCI style groups in the 1980s and now does studio work uh, out of New York City. So Pat Petrillo, great drum set player. Um, we did a big, big clinic together there. It was pretty, pretty incredible. Uh, the last bit here is sharing the passion, sharing our journey. Uh, I'm gonna play a piece for you at the end called The Adventures of Joe 90. Um, but what I'd really like to express to all of you listening there today is these are pictures of diverse groups that honestly would never have met one another unless it was for rudimental drumming. And that's been a huge blessing for me is to be able to connect our stories together to honestly make our world a better place by using two pieces of wood in our right and left hand. And I always say this to people that those two drumsticks actually have more power than most politicians wish they could ever have in the world. Because I could play a double stroke role and you play a double stroke role. We play the double stroke role together and already we're communicating and we haven't said one word to each other. So I think it's a very powerful statement. 
uh, in here, there are drummers from Finland. There are drummers from Switzerland, drummers from Washington State, drummers from California, drummers from Geneva, drummers from Russia and, and Finland, so, and Norway. And I think it's one of those powerful things that you read the headlines of the news and you understand these different places maybe are challenging, but in reality, we're all just people and we all play together. Some more here. It's a performance we did in Times Square. Uh, it's a picture from, of Ralph Nader and Harvey Thompson of BIOS, Kit Chatham from Cirque du Soleil, and a photograph of us meeting the Pope. We got to play rudimental drumming for the Pope a few years ago. It was a great time. So my last question to you is, what is your big stage? What are you performing for and why do you want to be good? And if it's for a single performance uh, that's kind of short-sighted, I would always ask, who are you trying to influence and who are you trying to make better? Because that's helping you build the legacy. So the last things here, what are, you, why, what are we playing for? Who are your influences? Who are you trying to honor? What inspires you? And how do you stay motivated? I'll be a life learner, social media workshops like today. And I will end with this. My drum instructor always said that this is never our art form to keep. It is only ours to give. So we have to give it on. And with that, I'd like to say thank you to my folks who helped me get where I go. And I will play one more piece for you. That was great. Uh, just before you go, thank you very much. Um, some folks here ex expressing how how wonderful your hands are, and John says, "Damn it, swings! It swings! It swings like crazy!" And I have a <laughs> I have a question from you from uh, Gerasimo Tsangarakis. Uh, he say he says uh, articulation, musicality, deep knowledge of uh, the instruments. Thanks for all the uh, the interesting historical and technical uh, details, Mark. Any book, method, recommendations to build up articulation and endurance, please? Absolutely. So uh, a few different ones. I think the John S. Pratt books are always good. Um, we've also talked about the Dominic Cuccia book if you're trying to go a little bit further into the more modern style. Um, Dominic Cuccia puts a good book out as well as um, I always use John Wooten's book. So I love not trying to totally plug John all the time, but uh, his rud rudimental reference book, as well as Dr. Throwdown's uh, rudimental remedies. I use those for a lot of my students, but we do a lot of listening though, and a lot of listening and moving of the rudiments between a quarter note, half note, and all of that. 
All right. I want to thank you very, very much for your time. It was very inspiring. I, uh, all the Greek people, I think they, they enjoyed it very much. And uh, hopefully we'll see you in, in the summer here. Yes, exactly. <laughs> We have two invitations, and I'm, I mean them. We have people come over quite a bit. So thank you very much, Alexander. Thank you for organizing this fantastic day. It's an honor and a privilege, my friend. It's an honor for me, for us too. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So, Ciao. Cheers. Συνεχίζουμε λοιπόν. Ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ τον Mark Riley για αυτή την καταπληκτική παρουσίαση. Λοιπόν, πάμε σε ένα γρήγορο break και ερχόμαστε σε τρία λεπτά περίπου με τον John Wooten.